So as much as we know about sepsis, we are still looking for better ways to treat it. We have this new three drug cocktail that's been out for a little while now of vitamin C, thymine, and steroids. And now that we've got some more robust data, we've shed some light on the question, is the juice worth the squeeze? It's very bad. I got, I got a better one. How about uh, vitamin C and sepsis? Is it ready to graduate to the sepsis guidelines? That's equally bad. My name is Craig Kokio, and welcome to the EM PharmD podcast, your source for everything related to drugs and emergency medicine, and maybe even a little bit more. Today, I want to talk about a huge paper that just came out earlier this week in JAMA called the Vitamin Study. Now, this paper looked at vitamin C, thymine, and steroids compared to hydrocortisone alone in a septic patient population in the ICU. And you may ask, why would we use this three drug cocktail in any septic patient? Well, it goes back to about 2017 when we had this incredible report from Paul Merrick who reported that that three drug cocktail in his septic ICU patient population improved the ICU mortality of that subset of patients from around 40% to 8.5%. Again, just by using that three drug cocktail, it's pretty amazing to get that outcome. So one question you might ask yourself is, well, why aren't we using this three drug cocktail right now in our septic patient population? And really that comes down to the quality of the evidence of that initial report. There is a number of methodological issues on top of the study being relatively small in and of itself that led a lot of practitioners and other investigators to really hold off and wait for more evidence before jumping on this boat of the three drug cocktail. Well, that day is here. We've actually got more evidence in the form of the vitamin study. But before we go in to talk about that, let's take a look at why we would actually want vitamin C and thymine to treat sepsis. Well, we actually know that vitamin C levels in patients that are septic are actually quite low. And by giving vitamin C back to these patients, we're actually able to improve inflammatory markers like reactive oxygen species activity, inflammatory cytokines, and also modulate some nitric oxide function. We also believe that vitamin C plays an important role in maintaining endothelial linings. And sepsis being a condition where we have disruption in our endothelial linings, we think that supplementing it back is actually an important function in maintaining this hemodynamic important response. And we even know that vitamin C plays an important role endogenously in terms of catecholamine synthesis as well as cortisol synthesis, two things that we know play a big role in sepsis. Thymine deficiency in sepsis is another common finding and also associated with increased mortality. So we know that thymine deficiency is linked to Wernicke's encephalopathy as well as cardiac abnormalities in the form of beriberi. Now, that sounds like a sunny tropical island you might want to visit. It's actually an important cardiac condition that can, in a number of ways, resemble sepsis. So having both at the same time might spell disaster for patients. What's not currently known is what role the vitamin deficiencies at hand, so vitamin C and thymine, actually play in sepsis and the pathogenesis of it. Which brings us back to our clinical question at hand. Does supplementing vitamin C and thymine back to these septic patients improve patient outcomes? And that's where we get the vitamin study. But it's important to remember that just because something is outside of a normal value doesn't mean you should go chase it and try to fix it. This is literally the thing that they tell you not to do the first day of pharmacy school, nursing school, or med school, which is fixing the numbers and not the patient. We want to fix the patient and not the numbers. So it's always important to remember those things. So we have a great example to pull from with sepsis specifically. So a number of years back, we had a drug called Zygris, which was activated protein C. And we initially thought that this drug was going to improve mortality significantly in our patient population because it improved a very important hypothetical uh, physiological function. But just supplementing that one element back didn't end up doing very positive things for patients, and actually increased mortality in real, real world practice. So ultimately, it ended up being pulled from the market from a lack of efficacy and also serious safety issues with a lot of bleeding in these patients. So it's understandable why we have a lot of skepticism when this three drug cocktail, which actually seems quite safe, is trying to tout all these big time outcomes. Now, there's no similarity in terms of safety between this three drug cocktail and Zygris, but there are some common lessons we can learn. Believe me, I want this drug cocktail to work. It's relatively safe, somewhat inexpensive, and in a way, it's kind of like TXA for a trauma. And now we've actually got some high quality evidence to actually point us in the right direction to see, is this a drug cocktail we want to use in our septic patient population? So now let's get back to that vitamin study. So let's take a closer look at the vitamin study, which was published in JAMA on January 17th, 2020. 
So the vitamin study, which stands for the vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine in patients with septic shock trial, was an investigator-initiated multicenter open-label parallel group randomized clinical trial conducted in 10 ICUs in Australia, New Zealand, and Brazil. Patients were included in this study if they were admitted to the study site ICU with a primary diagnosis of septic shock based on the sepsis-3 consensus document, which had to be fulfilled within a maximum of 24 hours prior to enrollment. Sepsis was defined as a suspected or documented infection and an increase of greater than two points in the SOFA score. Septic shock was defined as sepsis and the need for vasopressor therapy to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65 for more than two hours and a lactate greater than two despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So this study actually had quite an extensive list of exclusion criteria. And you have to look into the supplementary document uh, on JAMA to actually look at the complete exclusion criteria. And I actually have this ratio I use. It's kind of like the tooth to tattoo ratio we use in emergency medicine. It's the manuscript to appendix ratio. So if your appendix is actually greater than your manuscript, you've got to make sure you read that appendix because there's a lot of hidden uh, information in that that's important to your interpretation of that study. So let's take a look at that exclusion criteria. This study excluded anyone younger than the age of 18, patients with a DNR, had imminent death, and a diagnosis of septic shock longer than 24 hours ago. They also excluded anyone who had a suspected disease with a strong indication or contraindication to any of the study drugs and any other indication for hydrocortisone other than septic shock. They also excluded patients with a known history of HIV, G6PD deficiency, patients who were transferred from another ICU or hospital with a diagnosis of septic shock for more than 24 hours, patients with a diagnosis of septic shock for more than 24 hours, patients with known or suspected of any of the following, a history of oxalate nephropathy or hyperoxaluria, short bowel syndrome or severe fat malabsorption, acute beriberi disease, acute Wernicke's encephalopathy, malaria, scurvy, Addison's or Cushing's disease. The patients were also excluded if the clinician expects to prescribe glucocorticoids for another indication other than septic shock and this didn't include nebulized or inhaled corticosteroids. The patients were also excluded if they were receiving systemic antifungal treatment or had a documented strongyloides infection at the time of randomization, patients with known chronic iron overload due to iron storage and other diseases, patients previously enrolled in the study, and then finally, if the clinician expected to prescribe high-dose vitamin C for any other indication, those patients were also excluded. So once those patients met inclusion criteria, they were randomized in permutated blocks that were computer generated in sizes of two, four, and six in a one-to-one -one ratio, which was stratified by the randomization site. This study was also an open label study, which means that everybody involved knew what treatment they were getting. So the investigators, the study personnel, uh, and the clinicians at the bedside, as well as the patients all knew what they were getting, so nothing was blinded. So the intervention group got that three drug cocktail, which was vitamin C, 1.5 grams IVQ6, with hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams IVQ6, as well as thiamine, 200 milligrams IVQ12. The control group only received hydrocortisone IV, 50 milligrams every six hours. This group could have gotten thiamine IV for other open label reasons, However, only about 7% of the patient population actually ended up getting thiamine in that study arm, so it really didn't play a big role. The primary outcome of this study was whether or not the patients were alive and vasopressor-free at seven days after randomization. And vasopressor-free meant the patient couldn't receive any vasopressor for at least four hours. Now, there's a few important caveats to this. So if a patient died while receiving the index presser, they were assigned zero hours for this outcome. But if patients were weaned from all vasopressors for four consecutive hours, so they didn't re receive any vasopressor for four hours, but at any time during that seven day period had vasopressors restarted for any reason, they were still actually considered to have a successful primary outcome. So the sample size of 180 patients was calculated to have a 90% power with an alpha of 0.5 to detect a significant difference of 25 hours of vasopressor free hours between groups. And they got this number of 25 hours from the Merrick study, which represented two thirds of the effect size of observed in that paper. Now to account for dropout, the investigators plan to enroll 216 patients. There is a number of other secondary outcomes, like 28 day mortality and 90 day mortality. 
but I actually put those down in the description below as well as on the blog, so you can go through those on your own. And we can discuss some of those in the results. The study investigator screened 786 patients, randomizing 216 with 211 included in the primary analysis, which ended up being their intent to treat patient population, and all patients were accounted for. The typical patient in this study was a 62-year-old male admitted from the ED to the ICU for septic shock. The primary infection site was either lung, GI, urine, or skin. And most patients were intubated and mechanically ventilated at the time of randomization. And 93% were on norepinephrine at the time of randomization. This was a really sick group of patients. So one thing I'd like to point out is that the actual median time from meeting study criteria to actually receiving their first dose of vitamin C was 12.1 hours, and this ranged from 5.7 to 19 hours. The study group received treatment for a mean of 3.4 days, which was much shorter than the allotted time of 10 days that they could receive therapy for. So here it is, the primary outcome. What did the investigators find? So remember, the primary outcome being time alive and vasopressor free at seven days, and the result was no difference. So there's no difference in median time alive and free of vasopressors up to seven days after randomization, with a median of 122.1 hours in the intervention group and 124.6 in the control. And again, this difference was not statistically significant. Of all of the secondary outcomes that the study investigators looked at, none of them were significant except for one. That was the change in SOPA score at day three, which was significantly greater in the intervention group by one point. These results were consistent through the multivariate sensitivity analysis, which adjusted for site and baseline imbalances and maintained the findings of no difference. As for safety, there were two adverse events identified in the intervention group, which was fluid overload and hyperglycemia, and one adverse event in the control arm of a GI bleed. And in a post hoc analysis, there is no difference in death or vasopressor redependence. So again, patients needing vasopressors again. So not only did the vitamin C, thiamine, and steroid cocktail not demonstrate any benefit over steroids alone, we could hardly find any demonstrable therapeutic benefit in any of the secondary outcomes except for the SOFA score at day three. Even looking at the vasopressor dependence in one of the figures, we see that over time, patients required just about the same amount of pressors throughout the course of therapy. So any sort of treatment benefit, we couldn't observe it. And you can even, it's important to look at this study uh, in this table rather, and look at the actual dose of vasopressors given, which was actually relatively low. So on average about, you can see that patients got 0.4 microgram per kilogram per minute. And in my practice, this is actually a fairly low, almost your kind of second titrated dose. So patients actually had a fairly low requirement for sepsis, perhaps suggesting that this wasn't a super sick patient population, despite those baseline demographics that made it look quite sick. Well, although vasopressor dose is a surrogate for mortality, this study used a composite endpoint of vasopressor dose and mortality to try to find a benefit. So if it, the study was really just looking at mortality, we probably would have needed a much larger, larger sample size. However, I'm not certain that and entirely confident that even increasing the sample size here would have actually been able to de demonstrate a observed uh, treatment benefit in terms of mortality alone. So again, really, being disappointed in terms of the results of this study. One thing I wish this study did differently was actually start the cocktail earlier in the emergency department, which is something that we would do in real life. So I can imagine a patient hitting the door and while we're getting their uh, early bundle into them within an hour, we could easily get the first dose of vitamin C in at least an hour, maybe even two hours at the most. And it's not certain what treatment effect that might have on the patient population. And that's actually one of Dr. Merrick's primary critiques with this study, and he actually had a chance to respond to it, and you can see that video online. But even if we did start it early, I'm still not certain that we would observe the impressive treatment effect that we saw in that initial Merrick report. And yes, more studies are going to be coming out about this. I'm really not quite confident that we're actually going to see any sort of treatment benefit demonstrated across those studies. We're probably going to see a few pockets of subgroups that are going to have some benefit, but in general, I think this treatment is probably not beneficial to patients in a large scale. There might be certain patients that could benefit again, but again, I don't think this is going to end up being in the guidelines and I don't think it should be added to your uh, sepsis panel at this time. But those are just a few of my thoughts. I want to know your opinion. So if you think 
vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids sh should still be a component of sepsis care, write oranges down in the comments below. And if you think you're still skeptical about this evidence, write more data. Thank you for watching this first episode of the EM PharmD podcast. I'm really excited. I hope you liked it. If you didn't, I actually want to hear from you. So tweet at me, send me an email, and you can find my email in the information down below. Let me know what we need to do better, and let me know if you liked it. It's always helpful to have some positive uh, encouragement. Also, don't forget to subscribe to get notified whenever we have a new video come out. And thanks again for watching.